welcome. Thank you all for, for being with us. We'll go ahead and open the May 11th Park Board meeting at 3.32. Again, reminding those on the virtual members, if I don't acknowledge any member raising their hands, um, I'm not ignoring you again. It's more likely I just don't see you. So I would appreciate anyone bringing the unacknowledged to my attention. Roll call. Um, Christina, as I mentioned, is absent, excused. I don't know how we are on the other members. Nick Sally. Looks like we have it. Just missing. Yep. I think we have everybody here. Councilman Bingle will be late. Please excuse. And then Barb. And Barb is online also. <coughs> All right. So we will go to additions or deletions to the agenda. Uh, due to an anticipated increasing public comments regarding the two action items from land committee regarding the Upper River Drive Dog Park and the Beacon Hill Phase Two project. We have moved all the comments relevant to those. Their new position will follow the park's presentation contained in the land committee reporting. And the following changes to the regular order of business will be in place for today's meeting. There will be an open forum for topics not on the agenda and that will immediately precede the consent agenda approval. This will replace public comments, which is currently li listed as topic number nine on the agenda. We will also be switching the, under the land committee, we will be switching the presentation of the action items two and one. Number two will go first, followed by number one. That's at a request of the land chair. Um, so public comments relating to agenda topics will follow the presentations by the park staff. We feel listening to and understanding the presentations before commenting on their effectiveness will be the best format. All comments and questions either supportive of or contrary to will take place following the park staff presentation as listed under the land committee action items. And again, number two will go before number one. And to allow time for everyone to participate, we ask all comments be limited to two minutes and then there will be a vote on these two action items following discussion at today's meeting. So we will move to the open forum and then that is for any public comments not relating to the two action items in land. So I believe we have Nancy McCarroll. So I'm here to thank you for finally, after six years, starting the Susie Stevens Trail. And I wanted to let you know who Susie was. She was a bicycle and, and pedestrian safety advocate. She grew up in Spokane, went to Lewis and Clark High School, went to Japan with the Girl Scouts and with the Rotary. Uh, after that, she taught English there, learned that bicycling is not just fun, it's also transportation. She became the director of the Bicycle Alliance of Washington and a founder and the first director of the uh, Thunderhead Alliance, which is a North American uh, alliance of pedestrian and safety and bicycle advocates. Um, I got money from her death. She was killed in St. Louis, run over by a bus, and I received a settlement from the bus company. I used it to further her the thing she was interested in and to plant the Susie Forest around the world. But I took, in, in 2017, when I turned 80, I gave the remaining money to the Parks Department to build the Susie Stevens Trail. And I have my uh, shirt that was given to me. And there was a beautiful reception given for me in 2020. You've not received a thank you note because I planned on taking the beautiful shovel that you gave me um, doing at the groundbreaking and send you a picture of a dirty shovel. So hopefully that will happen soon, even though some of you were not on the committee at the time. So I do want to thank you. And I have some Susie bookmarks that I would like to get give to you all so that you'll know more about my daughter. And uh, also, it says a pedestrian path, but I hope people realize it's also for bicyclists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Nancy. Nancy. 
I think on behalf of the board, and I'm sure a lot more than just us, the whole community thanks you for all your efforts for sticking with this. What a, what a great project, and it's because of you it happened. Thank you, Nancy. All right. Karen Mobley. Thank you. Thank you all for having us back. I just wanted to invite everyone to Nature Day at Lincoln Park, which will be on Saturday. Um, it starts at 8 and goes until 1. We have ladies and gentlemen from Audubon and from Native Plant Society and others coming to give tours of Lincoln Park at, on the hour and the half hour between 8 and noon. There'll also be a park cleanup and um, we have a crew lined up. Thanks to Josh and all the people in ops, we're going to have some garbage bags and all that stuff. So if anybody wants to come, it's free. And any of you who've been involved in this whole conversation about Lincoln Park, I'd really like to encourage you to come because you'll have a chance to walk around with one of the cool bird watchers who's been advocating with you about the park. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy, Thank you. very much. All right, now we will move to the, oh, do we have one more? Two more. Oh, okay, sorry. Jeff Lambert. Thank you, Jeff. Well, hi, I'm Jeff Lambert. Um, I'm the newly elected president of Friends of the Bluff, mm -hmm. and the Friends are working hard on stewardship projects, including tree trimming, trimming, thinning, tree <laughs> planting, Seems like the trees aren't in the right place. Um, <laughs> trail building and maintenance as well as noxious weed removal. We appreciate working with uh, Angel Spell. So it, it really is delightful that we get an immediate response and she comes out and uh, helps us figure out uh, uh, what we can do. Uh, I'm also pleased that the natural lands priority identified in the uh, master plan and want to help uh, develop the criteria. Uh, I know there's been some confusion about Lincoln Park and Underhill and others. And of course, if there aren't criteria, it's hard to know how to proceed with that. Um, the uh, Natural Lands Program goals are ambi ambitious. And um, uh, I think we want to look within the current park inventory, not just new acquisitions. A lot of terrific smaller areas, and for that matter, larger areas within the city. I also recommend using the Washington Department of Natural Resources Natural Area Program as a model. It was started in 1987. They have a lot of experience. They have over 120 sites, so you don't have to start from scratch. So anyway, um, that's it. Look forward to uh, working with you guys more in the future. Thank, thank, thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Congratulations on your presidency. <laughs> you know how that goes. A lot of <laughs> Jericho. Karen. Jericho Cairns, and hopefully I got that right, Jericho. Close enough. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. Sorry, I came directly from work. Um, my name is Jericho Cairns. I live in the West Hills. Uh, a lot of people in Spokane don't know where the West Hills is even located. Uh, a buddy of mine calls it West Hilliard these days for good reason. Um, we're having some major issues in all of our city owned and operated parks. So if you haven't been out to our parks, it includes Palisades Park. It also includes Rimrock. Indian Canyon, which is actually an official city park. It extends down into People's Park, all the way up into Highbridge Park. Uh, if you ran Bloomsday, you ran through my neighborhood. Um, you've probably been out on Fish Lake Trail as well, or maybe taken some family photos at Ottawa, or sorry, Finch Arboretum. So if you're not aware, I've been in contact with Garrett Jones. I've been in contact with city code enforcement we're having major eco ecological damage, and I can't understate it. Uh, we are seeing lots of unsheltered people camping in city-owned parks. 
Um, the camping is the tip of the iceberg. There are fires, including arson. We have evidence of poaching. Uh, so there's a lot of animals that have been killed. We found massive burlap bags full of bones. This has re been reported to the Department of Fish and Wildlife. I filed complaints with the Department of Ecology. I filed complaints with city and county code enforcement. I've been in, in contact with our county commissioners. Uh, the tricky part about West Hills is jurisdiction. So there's a lot of different county and city boundaries, and there's a lot of confusion over who's responsible for what, uh, or what we call diffusion of responsibility. Um, unfortunately, those of us that reside in the West Hills and enjoy these parks, we've been threatened with pit bulls and German shepherds. Um, people have threatened to slice our throats for enjoying the parks. We found abandoned vehicles. We found large, massive dump piles, uh, as well as biohazardous waste in these city parks, including needles and other biological hazards. Uh, a DNR stream that flows from Indian Canyon Mystic Falls to the mouth or confluence of Latok Creek, Hangman Creek, has been absolutely destroyed. Buffer zones are not being protected. Uh, the DNR has not responded to our concerns. And so we're running out of options. We're running out of time. We're seeing foliage and priority habitat and species being destroyed daily. And when I leave here, I'm gonna go drive right through it and see it ongoing from Riverside Avenue all the way along Government Way, all the way up to Palisades. Um, so I'm here to ask for your help. I'm here to ask for some coordination. Um, I have suggested, and it's already uh, been not approved, but there's been a lot of expressed interest in combining these city parks into what we call a national resource conservation area. Mm -hmm. And an NRCA has already been done in Spokane. So Dishman Mica or Dishman Hills is a perfect example. And so there are ways to protect these lands greater than they have been. You could employ some county and potentially state resources to protect all of these contiguous parks that right now are considered conservation land, open spaces. Um, I've reached out to the city council. Uh, President Beggs has expressed interest. Spokane River Keepers is also uh, very interested in ways to protect the waterways, including Latok Creek, Hangman Creek, uh, Spokane River shoreline, because it's a big hot mess for lack of a better term. Um, I have text messages on my phone from my neighbors who are getting harassed every time they try to walk through a city park. They're being threatened. They've called the police. They've called the sheriff. We've called city, count, city and county code enforcement. Unfortunately, everybody is outmanned and outgunned by the shelter, uh, sorry, the unsheltered people that have taken over. These are green spaces. They deserve protection. I need your help. I'm happy to talk offline. I've sent uh, your secretary, Garrett Jones, countless pictures. I've emailed Jonathan Bingle, uh, countless pictures. I would love a site visit. I would love to show people where the problem areas are. I can map it out on ARC GSI maps for the city or scout maps for the county. You have to get on foot to see a lot of these areas. There are massive dump piles, anywhere from 8,000 to 10,000 plus pounds of trash per site. Code enforcement cannot keep up. So when you're interested to come visit the West Hills, call me. I'll take you on a tour. It'll be eye-opening. Uh, the graffiti includes lots, lots of words I can't repeat here. We're waiting on graffiti teams from the city to come help us out. Uh, but the private citizens can't keep up. Uh, Friends of Palisades is very interested in more protection for this area. I have a particular interest in Indian Canyon. It's close to my home. I take my children there, I paddle the rivers, I paddle the creeks. I've been exploring these areas for over a decade. I've never seen this much ecological damage in my lifetime in Spokane. So it's unprecedented, it re needs more resources. I don't have your personal contact information. You can access mine, Garrett can share it with you. He has my email, he has my cell phone. Please, please help us, thank you. Thank you, Thank Jericho. You. I, I know Garrett did share the emails with us that you sent, so. Any others? Nope, that's it. Very good. All right, we will move to the consent agenda. 
We have 10 action items on the consent agenda. Is there any board member that would like to edit this current consent agenda? If not, I will move to approve this, the current consent agenda as, as stated. Is there a second to that? A second. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Technology. 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 All right. Let's. All right. We'll go ahead and we'll put this and we'll put to numerous votes. To numerous votes. Sounds like. Sounds like. All those in favor, those please in favor, uh, raise your hand. 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 All those opposed? All those opposed? You're muted. 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 I think we'll pause. You're unmuted. That did pass. And we'll wait a minute to see if we can get this fixed. people so that they could say I can't hear what you're saying. I unmuted people so they could say yay or nay and okay. All right. All right. All right, that was interesting. <laughs> so now we move to our uh, our special guest. And where is that? The Spokane Youth Center and Senior Center's Association Quarterly Update. Claudia Auerkirk will be presenting to us tonight. They're in the backyard. Back? I thought they were fixing the kitchen. Yeah, but I'm in a meeting, so um, I kicked them out. All right. Let's see if this will deliver. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Claudia Auerkirk, and I'm the executive director of Corbin Senior Center. And I'm very honored to be here today in front of you because I know all the work that you're doing, it sometimes probably seems like, oh my God, you can't get through it. But you are doing good work, and Corbin has been a recipient of that, and I want to say thank you. Um, I got to talk with a lot of the other senior centers, and they feel the same way. So I wish they could all be here to say what they're doing, but I'm going to kind of represent them today. I wanted to talk a little bit about what the Surgeon General's information just came out, and it said that um, widespread loneliness in the United States poses health risks, and it's as deadly as smoking um, several cigarettes a day, hmm. and that's what loneliness is doing. So we're all kind of seeing the tail end of that with COVID and that loneliness that's been going on there. So senior centers, youth centers are absolutely vital in um, the wellness of people as we move forward. So I wanted to start with um, some of the highlights of our senior center here. As you can see, we have several of our centers that offer services throughout um, Spokane. Um, and this isn't even a representation of all of them. So the good work that goes into this is pretty amazing with the people that are running it and the numerous volunteers um, that it takes to run these centers. Um, hang on a sec here. Um, of course, all these centers have type of senior programs as well as youth programs that are vital to um, keeping people interactive, um, engaged, enriched, and empowered for their lives. And so all this work that's being done is able to happen with the, the work that we do at these centers as well as the support that we get from the board. So thank you for that. I wanted to share this next screen with you because it kind of gives you some numbers. And they're impressive numbers. Um, this kind of tells you what the attendance are of people that are, um, well, I'll take this first with the Northeast Youth Center, 8,766. And the volunteers it takes to run some of those programs is 274. As we go down the list, you can see the great numbers that it takes to be able to have these be successful programs, be the result of some of the work that are being done at these senior centers um, and some of the youth centers here. But what's really, really interesting to me are the volunteer hours. And volunteers are pretty, uh, a pretty amazing group of people because that's what it takes us to be able to run our center. I know at, at my particular center, there's only two of us. I could not do it without our volunteers. Um, we're, we've got programs going on constantly. And in some of the other senior centers and youth centers, they do too. And so a lot of hard work, a lot of hours that are spent into making sure that these programs are pulled off 
um, and keeping people engaged. It's such an important thing. When you look at the grand total, and this is just the first quarter, guys, um, 45,845 in the first um, quarter, and then in April it was 16,962. When we take a look over here at these attendance numbers here and what it means for all these volunteers, that is pretty impressive to me, that people are getting out and wanting to make a difference in their lives um, and in the lives of youth and seniors. So such important roles for all these people here, and it's great to see the engagement. Could we see bigger engagement at some of these centers? Absolutely. And this is something that we'll be challenged with as we move forward, is how are we gonna appeal to you as these baby boomers are coming down the, the pike, it's called the silver tsunami. They are here, they're spoiled, they want all the technology, they want all the fun stuff, the golf scrambles, the whatever have you, and how are we gonna address that and stay relevant as we move forward? So it's absolutely key that we continue to communicate with one another and find out how we're gonna solve some of those issues as we move forward. We can go to the next center, which is Hilliard Senior Center. All of you who know Jerry, um, many, many years of his dedication to the Hilliard um, area. My grandmother also attended this senior center, so it's kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, they served over 10,000 hours of program attendance and nearly 3,000 volunteer hours of recreational program services and other special events. Um, and they address several things. And there's just, it's just a small little snippet of things that they do there, including pinnacle, canasta, gin, rummy, uh, dominoes, um, 13, hand and foot, cribbage. Um, they love to play bingo, so um, obviously that's a big hit over there. They have a lot of activities that get people engaged. And of course, volunteers are running that. It's just kind of neat to see. And these are some of the programs. This is a, um, a WE program that's actually teaching some um, exercise classes, um, but here they are. They're not lonely. They're, they're, they're doing things with their lives, and it's so important to see that and very, very special. Uh, this is me. This is Corbin Senior Center, and I did bring with me today Denise Fesnick, which is my volunteer marketing person, whoever gets a volunteer marketing person, mm -hmm. and then our very special Nancy Maupin. So those of you that don't recognize Nancy, um, she's very precious to us. And of course, George and Nancy have been um, members of our senior center for many, many years, and we just lost George. So everybody say hi to Nancy. We're well, glad to have her. Um, one of the things that we have done a little differently at Corbin is we changed our logo. And if you noticed our logo, it, it represents growth, green. It means that we're moving and reaching up to the sky for greater and better things for our, our members there at Corbin. Um, and what's new for our members, our auction is coming up on May 21st at the Flight Museum. You are welcome to come and join us. Call me and I'll get you some information. We would love to have you participate in that. We're going to have a lot of fun. So not only do you get a chance to be at the museum, you also get a chance to enjoy some Ferraro's food. There's going to be a little bit of line dancing so you can see what our, one of our fun new things that we've just added to Corbin. Um, and that has been a huge success, so line dancing goes. I think I invited Garrett to come dance and Jennifer to come dance as well. Um, we had just recently uh, Commissioner Chris um, Jordan there with Betsy Wilkerson. Um, it was amazing to see the two of them. They came with Ahana. Ahana just recently did a, a donation for a computer station for uh, Corbin. Uh, they bought us two beautiful laptops, um, a computer station as well as printers. So now we're able to start some new programs and create other revenue streams because of that. So our community partners for all of our senior centers are extremely important to us. Um, and we continue to embrace those community partners to help us meet the needs. Because you know we uh, have to work hard to make those dollars and keep our doors open. Um, and we have a lot of great support in the community. So we're grateful for all of that. We'll move on here to um, Mid-City Concerns. Um, I actually work with this gentleman with Feet Spokane because that's one of our programs. Um, but he has doing some great things over there and he attends the meetings and he loves Arby's. I'm just gonna tell you, he loves Arby's. Um, they had their grand reopening. Members had an opportunity to speak with the staff at SNAP, um, CITA, our, our STA and Chaz Clinic. They have karaoke day, which seems to be a huge uh, hit over there. So you might want to stop in and sing a tune 
um, with these guys because they just have a lot of funny, a lot of fun over there, and there's just lots of laughing and giggling when I went over and came in those doors. It's fun to see that. You know, you're making differences when you when you do. This is Project Joy. I recently um, had Project Joy. I'm having them tomorrow for our Mother's Day celebration. They were here last week um, dancing. We also had the Hilliard Bells. Um, I think some of you may have seen it in the newspaper. Um, the Hilliard Bells were there and entertaining, and so they made the front of the news, which was really kind of fun. Uh, this is a great place to go and meet new people. They have several different programs that they offer the senior centers at no cost or little cost. I did do a donation to them because of the work that they do in, the t in this town. Um, they do a lot of work, and they also practice in my building, so I know how much time and effort went into their presentation for us. And so um, Corbin did a $100 donation to Project Joy. Uh, so really do enjoy them, and they offer us opportunities at low cost. Uh, let's see here. West Central Community Center, they have some exciting things going on as well. In their first quarter, they provided backgammon three days a week. I'm jealous. I don't get to do that in my place, so I might have to head over there myself. Um, they do put on a great talent show for staff and parents, and that was an exciting, fun thing because um, they had quite a crowd that showed up for that, and they were really um, pretty excited that they were able to pull that off in the short time that they had to put it together. Um, they also participated in the Scout Reach pilot program, um, Division of the Boy Scouts of America, emphasizing services in minority populations. Um, this is just really great work because you see the intergenerational um, happenings going on, which is so important because we know youth of today, it's a little bit frightening. So the importance of being able to engage them in the greatest generation that is quickly passing away, as well as allowing children to have that interaction. We are starting some programs with Trinity Catholic School um, to be able to create opportunities for the kids to come and be with some of these older adults. Um, I won't call them um, old seniors because they'll pop me in the nose if they do. They're 29 and holding just as I am. So I certainly understand their love for, for kids and it's just a lot of fun. Uh, Frida, I called today. So Frida, I need your slide. I need it like yesterday. Um, and so she didn't know what to do. So she sent me a picture of this beautiful woman here who just finished a painting. Um, you know, the uh, Martin Luther King Center has had some challenges, um, but that doesn't stop Frida from being as precious as possible and making sure that they're providing these programs to people. So they have children's services, family services, community services, as well as food banks, opportunities for people to be able to express themselves through art and music. And this was just one of the gals that um, sent the painting. So she sent me just that picture of the painting. So I had to go on there, pull some pictures for her, and put some stuff up. Um, I love Frida. She wanted to be here today to learn how to do this. Did she make it? She made it. <laughs> there she is, the very beautiful gal herself. So I just love it. And uh, it's neat that you can see that people have a way to express themselves in safe surroundings. So that's what our centers do for us. This is the Northeast Youth Center. Um, this is a lot of fun. I haven't been here in a few years. I need to go ahead and get myself back out there so I can experience some of the fun things that they're doing. Um, it says that in their first quarter, we held our annual fundraiser, and they brought in $85,000. That is amazing. And you know, all those proceeds are going to go back to their community, enriching the lives of these children, um, growing opportunities for them, and I just love that. So I just wanted to give them great kudos for their success on that. That's a hard thing to do in an uncertain times, um, to be able to raise that much money. They've also improved their student food program, in addition to their chef, George, who... I needed my glasses, guys. Homemade delicious meals for our kids. As we know, sometimes they don't always get those meals. When programs close or school is on break, um, this is where these programs can continue to give back and provide um, opportunities for these children to have at least a couple meals a day, a day. So very important. There are other centers here in town. I didn't get everyone's slide, but I do want to say that we are very grateful for the park board. We know that you're challenged with a lot of things. Um, I ask you to continue to take a look at your numbers. Think of Corbin. Um, I want you to be proud of the work that's being done um, at all of these centers. When I called some of their administrators, they were so busy, they were not able to put um, things together because this is a time that people don't want to work. 
So you're finding people wearing 50, 60 different hats to try and run their programs. Um, so if you get a chance, everyone, to even take a day to go down and um, be a part of this, take a little bit of time to volunteer, they would absolutely love it. It's the volunteers that make the magic happen in these places, and so kudos to all of our volunteers, and thank you, Park Board, for all that you have to offer us. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Yes, and I have my casine, so you know what's happening. <laughs> and thanks to all the volunteers that help you. I know they put in a tremendous amount of hours each year, each yeah. day. Yeah. All right. Uh, Bob, if I might, I, I have had the Please. experience of being at the Corbin Senior Center and been treated to lunch. These people can cook. Mm -hmm. This is good food. And I have to say that line dancing is a great cardio workout, so go. <laughs> Perhaps we have lunch there then sometime. <laughs> Good plan. They can cook. All right, we will move on then to our financial report and budget update. Rich? All right, thanks for having me back for uh, round two. Next installation of our uh, financials for April. I'll keep it pretty brief here. I know we have a full agenda, so just touch a couple highlights on each of these, but I will keep them uh, jam-packed and riveting for you. So I have one on park fund and then one on golf, just like last month. Park fund, really no major concerns there. You can see again in gray expenses and in green revenues. So if you look at those first two, you can see expenses are trending ahead of the two-year budget just slightly. But kind of on that second bullet point there, um, actually, I will change that just a bit. Sorry. Um, yeah, I, I added a couple bullet points there. Sorry, lost my train of thought there. <laughs> uh, just ahead of the two-year budget average. I did want to comment on that second bullet. Should have put that first. Um, we are actually operating expenses year to year, so I don't put a year to date figure on here. Year over year, we are 660,000 below last year's expenses. So I mentioned it at finance committee, and just a reminder that we did a transfer last year in April of 1.3 million for capital. This year, we're gonna do that in three installments of 250,000. So we did one of those in April. So we are actually trending well below last year's expenses, but that's the primary reason why on that. And then on revenues, those middle two green ones, you can see we're trending just slightly ahead of the uh, budget two-year average. I think worth noting on there is year-to-date, we are 60,000 ahead of last year's revenues. And then just the math of those two, we are 211,000 over the two-year budget average. And then the sum of those gets you to those final two green ones, which year-to-date revenues compared to year-to-date expenses, we are 1.37 million in the surplus between the two. So really trending where we were supposed to be for this time of year. Any questions on parks fund before golf? Golf fund is where all the action is. So we are on a comeback. <laughs> Sun's out and we are coming back. <laughs> if you remember last month, we were about a quarter of the revenue and 18 whole rounds that we were. So you'll see a lot much better news on here. So expenses, those first two lines, you can see we're trending just a little bit above on expense lines. Uh, that second bullet point there, that's primarily those trees we had removed for the pine beetle that mm -hmm. ended up being about a $400,000 expense. I think a really good highlight for golf, though, is they, for operating expenses outside of that, are lower than last year's operating expenses. So they're absorbing a lot of that through other cost savings measures. And then you see in those middle two, the revenues. So as far as comparing revenue to a two-year budget average, we're behind that schedule. But on that first bullet point there, it is a fierce comeback. So April was a really good month coming back 183,000 versus last April. So kind of the accumulation of those two is shown in that last uh, two slides there, or last two bars on the right. So net revenues to expenditures, golf's down about 7,400 per the year, but that will be in the positive in May for sure. And then I had just a couple graphs here from our new dashboard reporting that I mentioned last mm -hmm. month. Mm -hmm. I think that first one was in the last one. That's just 18 holes played. And last month, we were about a quarter of where we were the prior year. You can see that 17,000 versus last year's 20,000. So about 85% mm -hmm. now of what we were last year. And then I did not include this bottom one last month. This is a look at the cumulative revenue by day. 
So if you look basically day zero down here is January 1st, day 365 being the end of the year. I think this will give you a good trajectory throughout the year as where we're trending day by day. So I think this green here being 2023, you can see the late start we got. That was flat pretty much until day 80, where in prior years we were already collecting revenue and people were golfing. Of course, you can see the 2020 here when we closed the courses. But I think the highlight here is just how quickly that green line is recovering and has caught up to the 2022 for revenue. So I think that shows the trajectory is headed the right way for golf and should be just fine. That's my report. Questions or comments? Nice graph, Rich. Yes. yes. <laughs> nice graphic. Thank Thanks you, Rich. So Thank you. It's amazing what a little warm weather does for golf. Yep. <laughs> More coming this weekend. <laughs> yeah. Cold you. and rain makes it tough to play, I believe. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rich. All right, we will move down to the special discussion item. And Garrett, you're going to share the screen on that. So, Yes, Bob. Thank you for not asking me to do so, or it would probably start vibrating again and repeating itself. <laughs> so anyway, the, I, I know I sent out an email to the board members regarding this. Public comment on our... Typically, we've been placing public comments in the, on the number three slot on our agenda. Our bylaws have it on the number 10 position. You know, personally, I don't care which one it occupies, but I do believe it sh they should be congruent. So we thought we'd talk about that uh, tonight, get people's thoughts. Hannah, will, as our, our legal person, will help us with how, how can we get it corrected. Um, and then at the bottom of it, there have been some changes to the, uh, to the way we host meetings and, and so on with, you know, some, some of the restrictions from COVID. I don't know if, if you want to go ahead and read through those, Garrett, or I can't see them well enough from here to read them. So if you would, that'd be great. All right. Happy to do so, Bob. Thank you, Garrett. All right. So, and, and this came from our, our legal team too. So our two representatives, Mike Piccolo and James Richmond, have helped us through this process. So. Um, so providing remote access is not required under the OPMA, but is encouraged. Meetings must be held at a physical location uh, listed in the meeting notice. Agencies must allow public comment on final action items to be voted on by the agency board. There must be a way for the public to provide comment on the final action items of the agenda. It could be as simple as allowing a written comment submitted um, at, at a time and date that we could then have in your packet. Um, the comments must be provided to all board members. And oral comments are allowed in person during the meeting. The agency must provide an opportunity when feasible for public to provide oral comment remotely. Example, telephone call or video conferencing if the member of the public has problems physically attending the meeting. Thank you, Garrett. Yeah. You know, that isn't something we're looking to vote on or make decisions on, simply information that you know, some of us, myself included, weren't aware of that have recently changed. What I would like, though, is to get people's thoughts on the position of the, the public comments. Do we want it near the top? Do we want it near the back? And, or does it not matter to people? But anyway, I would like to get comments. Councilman Bingo? And I think we chatted on the phone about this, but uh, one of the things that's been successful for us at City Council um, and allowing people to come and speak um, is moving the public comment period to the front, uh, open form to the front. But our, our open form rules are that you can't speak on an agenda item that's in the next two agendas mm -hmm. um, because we're going to be discussing those things and they have their own place for discussion. You can sign up there. So open form has to be related to city business um, and not on an upcoming agenda. I think that's something that's been successful for us and I would suggest something similar to allow public who, you know, might not have a couple hours to wait around in a meeting, might be good for them to just show up, give their opinion, and then they can move on as we're dealing with the rest of city business that doesn't necessarily pertain to them. When you do discuss an agenda item, are they allowed to comment during that meeting or how is that handled? Yeah, so during that particular item, you can sign up to speak and address that particular issue. Okay. And um, I, again, that, that's a system that works quite well. Okay, thank you. Yep. Other thoughts? I like moving public comment up to the front of the agenda because I think it's impolite to make people wait through a whole meeting. They have dinner, they have families, they have other things to do. Um, I think it's better use of their time and it allows them to say what they need to say and us to get on with our business. Others? 
I do think there's benefit to uh, people who are speaking to hear the presentations on a given item though. So uh, what we've done in the last couple of meetings to make sense to me, I think that if I were in attendance, uh, I would want the background information of whatever the item was as well. Yeah. We can con still continue to make temporary changes per meeting, you know, for, for agenda items. As and, we, go ahead. Sorry. No, uh, that's fine. And, and on those things, if you're speaking to a particular item, the comment comes after the presentation. Yeah. And so they mm -hmm. would sit through the presentation mm -hmm. and hear it. Open forum is simply for, you know, a business related to parks, not on an upcoming agenda. Okay. All right. yeah. Other comments on the placement, though, of the just open public comments? Hey, Bob, this is Sally. Um, I agree moving it up and allowing people to make public comment early on in the agenda makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Okay. Others? I, I also agree. Yeah, Hi, Bob. I this just, is Barbara Ritchie. I agree. Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. She said she agreed. Oh, okay. Yeah, I do too, Bob. Okay. Uh, I just think that uh, people have spent the time and energy, like Jennifer says, but also then it's fresh for us. It's something that we haven't heard. Uh, and then wherever that might be applicable, uh, we can move on forward from that. Mm -hmm. So, Hannah, how about guidelines on how we mm -hmm. make it permanently in the kind of the three position, I guess, where it's been? Right, so under the current bylaws, we have section nine that has a list of all the different agenda items. Right now, as you said, public comment is at the very end, right before adjournment of a meeting. Throughout the bylaws and other sections, there's three or four of them, they talk about how the president may change the order on a case-by-case -case basis due to whatever we need to discuss and when we need to discuss it. And I think that flexibility needs to remain because in certain situations, we do want to have that flexibility and um, you know, encourage public comment at the appropriate time without disrespecting the people who have come to make those comments and, and appreciating their time as well. So the next step for us is to have a amendment to the bylaws written up and it will be read and provided for at the board meeting. We will t take a vote on whether or not we think that that should be adopted or we can have you know, uh, a constructive conversation about how we're gonna change the language of that amendment to fit our goals. Once there's been a vote in favor of amending the bylaws, then the bylaws committee takes that back. We rework them, make sure everything's perfect. Um, and then at the next meeting, we have a final vote for adoption. Okay. Would you start that process? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Hannah. Mm -hmm. do, so do we're we... looking to move it up to the three, kind of the three position where it was before. Do we know how it's written in city council's rules? Because it sounds like it's a standing um, with the comments with each agenda. And we are making a temporary change each time, right? No, yeah, we, we don't make a temporary change. Open forum is set, those, those things are set, it makes it real simple. And I think what I'll end up doing is I'll, I'll take language from those, I'll read over those, I'll figure out how to make them fit our needs and I'll customize them with the bylaws that are already in place. And then when the amendment's proposed, we can even compare them to how the city council does it um, and decide if that's the best for us and how that will work in our meetings. Thank you so much, Hannah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hank. I, I'll, I'll have the city council rules sent to you so that you can see for reference. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, we moved through that rather quickly. Thank you all. So we'll move on to committee reports. The urban forestry tree committee being the first one. Kevin? We canceled our meeting this month. We will be meeting May 30th at 415 at the Shettle Park Library and WebEx. So then we will move to the land committee. And with this, we have the, the two action items and the comments that will follow. I know we're starting with action item two, Greta. Yes, we actually had seven action items at land committee, uh, five of which were uh, we just approved on the consent agenda. And two, which we wanted to present to the full board. We're switching the um, agenda round. We're, we're going to present item two AHBL Incorporated Architecture and Engineering Services contract for the Make Beacon Hill Public Phase Two project at Upriver and Camps, Camps of Connie Park. And Nick will give us a presentation on uh, everything that's going to be happening uh, 
at the Make Beacon Hill public uh, project. Sure thing. Uh, thank you for having me. So <clears throat> Make Beacon Hill public, this is phase two. Um, if you remember, Make Beacon Hill Public Phase 1 was a partnership between the county and the city in 2020 for a grant application to acquire uh, a, a number of acres of property and some easement across the Avista land to make uh, more of that land public protected from development and that sort of thing. And so that has been completed. And now we are following up with a separate grant this park board authorized in 2022 for us to do some development there for some trailhead improvements because we know the parking in that location is just not adequate. So we want to make those improvements. This is associated with that. Of course, that's the location of Beacon Hill. Um, there has been since 2007 or eight master plans drawn up for the Beacon Hill area. Um, that was done, a lot of it was done by the, the what is now the Evergreen mountain bike alliance um, of course parks was a part of that mike aho back in his days in recreation was a big part of that um, and this is a graphic of all of the land in sort of clearer image that is currently publicly owned publicly accessible uh, recreational use property so camps the county park and shields park both of which are the trailheads to access this area from below are woefully inadequate in terms of their infrastructure to support the activities that are happening. All of the lines, the squiggly lines you see there are all the trails. A lot of mountain biking, walking, hiking trails, uh, and wildlife corridor there. So we need to be able to formally design these two things. This is a, an image of Shields Park here, and we are here with a uh, recommendation for AHBL Incorporated to be our design engineer for this work. Um, you can see this parking lot. I don't think this adequately represents how much action is usually there. You can see the amount of for par overflow parking in areas that it shouldn't be, and so this needs to be uh, developed in order a way, uh, to support the use that's happening at Minnehaha. Um, so there was a process run by the county through the, uh, the course of last year, which generated this concept plan. On the right of that concept image is the existing parking lot, and on the left of it is that dirt area we saw all those cars. Um, this would actually improve that area, pave it, control that sedimentation, actually construct a paved walking path so that we can extend a trail on the north side of, the, of Up River Drive that is separated from the road. Um, that has you know, wood post and rail fence next to it, so it's much more comfortable for pedestrians. And then it would also design a pedestrian activated beacon with a crosswalk. So that's a protected crosswalk uh, along Up River Drive there. We know we want to make a connection to the Centennial Trail. Um, and we want pedestrians to be able to either come from the trail or go to the trail from this location. Um, and so that would provide you know, the additional safety we need on Up River Drive there. It also includes uh, a new bouldering playground which would be kind of cool. Um, that'll be something that folks can take their kids to and learn how to mountain climb or boulder, so to speak. And it also includes what we call an adaptive trail. Um, the, the rock face along Minnehaha is up here on the left. Sort of the Shields Park parking lot is at the bottom of the screen. This is not an ADA accessible pathway, but this is an improved natural sort of United, United States Forest Service pathway mm -hmm. to get folks and their equipment to that area more easily. So that would be some limited improvements in that area to really improve the access. And Spokane Adaptive provides um, climbing for uh, those with mobility impairments, and they're really excited about this. They've donated quite a lot of money to be able to help us build this. So that's, that's an awesome partnership. There's the kiddos, uh, the, the digital kiddos playing on the playground, <laughs> <laughs> something like that. So that's Shields Park. Camp Sakani Park, of course, is completely unpaved at this time and in need of uh, really proper trailhead development. Uh, we're looking to between double and triple the parking at this location. Um, you can see it here is when it's empty. I can't believe I was there when it was empty, but it's usually this full or much more full. Several tiers need to be regraded and improved to meet modern standards. We're also looking at proposing some safety lighting at these mm -hmm. locations, some general area lighting, especially in the back so our police officers can see and our sheriffs can see into these spaces so they're visible from the street, um, really to work at deterring some of that car camping that we know to happen in Shields Park. Um, there's also an existing restroom shelter there. We're looking to either relocate that or replace it with a, a pre-manufactured concrete CXT building, a pit toilet. That's a graphic of, you know, sort of a, a concept for that parking lot. Mm -hmm. Of course, we are good at concepts in our uh, architecture team here, but we really need the, the design engineering support of AHBL and, uh, or a consultant to, to make that real. So we issued an RFQ back in March. 
We got five responses to that, which is actually very strong. All local firms, all with a number of letters in their names, uh, <laughs> acronyms for whatever they are. Um, the, we did evaluate this with a scoring committee, jointly city staff and county staff, um, and AHBL Incorporated was determined to be the most qualified firm. So we have negotiated scope fee schedule with them since that time. That scope includes civil engineering, it includes permitting. Actually working near the shoreline, it's really important we get ecological uh, experience on our permitting team because we are moving through the substantial shoreline development process and Adura uh, and Vincent Bartels there is an incredibly strong partner to have on that team. So we're looking for civil engineering, structural, electrical, planning and permit support and then landscape architecture on this. And that's what this contract would do. This would get us from today to the end of this year, beginning of next, uh, through the design process and uh, to a biddable set of documents to build these parking lots in 2024. Any questions? Does the cost include materials? So it includes their reimbursable expenses and materials, yeah. Okay. It doesn't include construction. Right, right. okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? I had a question for Bob. Yes. Do we ask for public there, comment on this? There, there were no public comments on this well, one. The, the ones we it. have okay. are all for the dog park. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, any more questions from the board? No. Uh, in that case, I will move that we approve the AHBL Incorporated Architecture and Engineering Services contract for the Make Beacon Hill Public Phase Two project of River Park and Camp Sakani Park in the amount of $309,840, a non-taxable service. I second that motion. Oh. Moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Nope. All right, I will call for the question. All of those in favor, say aye and aye. or raise your hand. Aye. 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 Uh, opposed, say nay. It looks like the motion carries unanimously. So I, I think now that people will realize I get a better understanding of why we switched these two motions. This does explain, I think, some of the concerns for the dog park or at least presents perhaps some things that wouldn't have been presented. So anyway, that was the purpose of switching the two. So it's all yours again, Greta. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot, Bob. Um, <laughs> So now we have an action item, which is a resolution selecting Upriver Park as a location of a new community dog park and accepting ownership of a new neighborhood dog park at 2616 East 63rd Avenue. Uh, this is a no cost uh, resolution. Yes, so uh, you've seen many a dog park presentation. Uh, we won't go on uh, to great lengths, but we will provide some background here on, on the site selection process, overview of options evaluated, and then the, the recommendations presented here today. Uh, we are looking for a seven plus acre natural treed area that is drivable, accessible off of an arterial street that has parking or could be improved to have parking that is fenced and buffered from adjacent uses that is walkable, so not a mountain, not too steep, not uh, uh, a steep slope that protects the most critical habitat, wetlands, shorelines, et cetera, and that could have utilities available. That is our ideal site. Um, as you remember and you've heard before, we looked at every single city-owned uh, piece of property and then a number of county-owned pieces of property. Um, the yellow and red on this screen sort of being the ones that didn't make any sense. You know, you probably don't want a dog park at an airport or uh, at an active waste facility or something <coughs> like that, property too steep. So as we worked our way down through those sort of initial um, requirements with our consulting team, we determined there were about 42 potential sites within the city that are uh, suitable to be considered. And so we then scored them as a general location score and then a site-specific score. And that was worked through with a project advisory committee that had representatives from each of the three city council districts, veterinarian, um, some that were dog users, and some that were not. So I think we got a decent slice of what we were looking at in terms of that initial rating. Of course, that all occurred in an office in a, in a, in a room um, here within the city. So that was from April until about October of last year. In October, uh, that April start date really began with an MOU between City of Spokane and City of Spokane Parks and the Spokane Public Schools. 
Um, after we hired a consultant and ran through the advisory committee, we did have a public survey that went out. We had about 1,100 responses to that. <laughs> We did host five public open houses through that process. We had about 250 participants in that process. Um, got a number of comment cards and emails in addition to those sort of formal participants. Met with neighborhood councils on about a, uh, five, five neighborhood, uh, excuse me, five neighborhood council meetings. We've been in front of you a lot, five, four to eight times. And then just recently, we've connected with the upriver uh, neighbors that are directly adjacent to that site. So that just happened uh, yesterday. Um, as we look through the sites that have been evaluated here and considered, <laughs> uh, Lincoln, Underhill, Hazel's Creek were the initial top three sites for an official South Hill dog park. Those were deemed unacceptable uh, locations. Then we looked in the county. We didn't uh, deem any locations within the county available as well. Um, the next step was to look north and to look uh, east and west. And so we looked at High Bridge and Upriver and through our workshop looking at those two, uh, Upper where Upriver was determined to be the preference of the folks that attended that workshop. It is about a 20 minute drive from 57th and Regal, which would be near the, the unofficial South Hill Dog Park, which was displaced. It is the largest and flattest of the sites within the city sites that are considered. It does require a new parking lot. It does require additional uh, parking and it does require an improvement and there's no access to water. We would not propose to extend city water to this location. It's cost prohibitive to consider doing that. Um, it is so not proximal to the unofficial South Hill Dog Park. And while it was supported by uh, the number of the folks that attended our, our workshop, just under 78%, it is supported by the user groups at uh, that Beacon Hill. So that would be Evergreen Mountain Bike Alliance, Spokane Mountaineers, um, Bauer Climbing Coalition, Spokane Adaptive, and I feel like I'm missing one other there, but I should have it written down in a second. And it is opposed by the adjacent neighbors. Um, the, the neighbors oppose it, and I, I'm sure they'll speak for themselves here, um, on the basis of environmental concerns, safety concerns, and traffic concerns, all of which are valid concerns. So this graphic you've seen before, this is the area we've been considering. Um, it is about one and a half percent of the natural area that is at Beacon Hill. So we have about 500 acres, 495 to be exact, that are publicly owned between the city, the county, and Avista. So all within our management agreement for that area. So it's a small percentage of the overall land, but it's a big chunk of what you see on the screen. Shields Park would be to your left. It would require new parking, fencing. Um, it wouldn't be requiring a lot of surfacing upgrades. Uh, so no major grading. There is some pine beetle in the middle of that area. The, the drought the last couple of years, there's a nice little pocket of pine beetle that would need to be addressed as a part of any work. Um, and of course, it would need to have drainage facilities, swales constructed for the parking facility in order to properly treat that stormwater. So we went with our consultant and took a little bit closer look as a site analysis. So we have done no design here, but looking at the parts and pieces that might need to be addressed. Based on what we've heard, we've heard um, there is a need, that blue line, that sort of blue dashed line moving through the top portion of your screen is an existing soft surface trail that okay. is used heavily by a lot of the hikers and bikers in the area. We would want to leave that alone. Anything there or north would need to be accommodated as it sits today. Um, certainly we would want to make sure that folks are accessing this facility from upriver drive not from the private roadway or lane, which is on the north side of the property, which is going to be accessed for private property. Um, that is certainly not somewhere where we want to focus individuals. We would need to deal with those uh, pine beetles, which is easy enough. We got good at that at Downriver. Um, and then we would need to do a little bit of clearing right along the, the road with our detailed engineering if it were to be conducted. That would need to be done to make sure that the site triangles were right for the speeds on upriver drive. There would need to be a traffic study to determine where that driveway wants to be so that it's safe. Uh, so that's an important uh, piece of this. And then this big, heavy, squiggly line, I think one of the things we've learned here and through all of our dog park presentations is we need to buffer the people that live next to these things from that use. We need to provide significant distance between them and us or the dog park user. And so we would propose no less than and potentially more than 100 feet buffer from somebody's property line to be able to protect them, their wells, their infrastructure from our use and a public use. It also preserves natural land around the dog park so you can still walk and enjoy that space while there's folks using the dog park. 
So that's the sort of site analysis. We haven't really put pen to paper yet and are waiting to do that till after this discussion. Um, in addition to upriver, as I noted, there it's 20 minutes away from the unofficial South Hill Dog Park, so not a lot of help to the folks that lost access to that that amenity. So with SPS and Spokane Parks, we have uh, a generous offer, I would say, from SPS to build a neighborhood dog park very close to that original location. That's about a six-minute, five, six-minute walk from the original site. It's at 63rd and Regal, just north of the cemetery, if you're familiar with the area. It's about an acre and a half. Um, it is flat. It is accessible for utilities, so that is a place we could provide water access in the form of a dog and uh, person drinking fountain. And then it is primarily intended to be accessed by walking, so not parking in that location. So that we would be focusing regional use to the regional type facility and accommodating neighborhood use within the neighborhood that that facility serves. So that's the intention there to sort of mitigate that distance between upriver and the location at 63rd. So the, uh, the, the trick here um, is that this would be constructed by SPS at their expense and then deeded to and maintained by the City of Spokane Parks Department in perpetuity. So that is the, the agreement, so to speak, for that location. I think we've kind of hit on feedback already, but uh, just to restate, we did get letters of endorsement from a number of the users, um, but we do have opposition from the neighbors directly adjacent to the site. Um, and we have uh, the South Hill Neighborhood Dog Park as that mitigating factor for folks that just don't want to drive all the way to Upriver Park. So we're trying to strike the balance there between those two. Um, the dog park, adding a dog park in District 1 as a community dog park, this is Upriver, would meet goal B, objective one of your master plan. It would add, uh, it would be a first tier priority according to your plan. The one down there on the south side would be a second tier priority, and they sort of come together. So what does the resolution actually say? You've got the language in your packet, and we can talk in detail if you'd like. Mm -hmm. um, it would resolve to select Upriver Park as the new community dog park location, and it would resolve to accept ownership and maintenance of that 2616 East 63rd Avenue property and associated improvements as a new neighborhood dog park site. Um, this partnership, I think it's really important to stress this here, is thanks to that interlocal cooperative agreement between the city, parks, libraries, and SPS back, gosh, I can't remember the year, would have been 2019? 18, thank you, Garrett. Um, and that whole intent of that was to leverage each other's land and resources to develop fully, util fully utilized, cost-effective public facilities. So SPS and the park board would mutually agree that the dog parks proposed here satisfy the intent of that MOU, even though it's not on the South Hill, that something would provide the, satisfy the intent of that document, and that both locations would need to be improved in a manner that is consistent with the citywide dog park guidelines and with applicable building regulations. So that we need to be able to get permits and build everything in the appropriate manner. So if it's approved, we would begin uh, generating detailed designs and engineering and move forward as quickly as we can. That would include touches with the public. That would include a public design uh, meeting to be able to discuss, evaluate potential concepts. If it were not approved, SPS and, and parks could either recommend uh, alternate site at Highbridge as uh, sort of the next best option, or we could begin evaluating sites even further to the north. Um, we are up against the schedule consideration here, which is SPS has been waiting for us to select a location. There is a good chance, if we delay too long, that uh, the temporary dog park access could be lost before the replacement facility would be provided. So that is one of the schedule-related impacts um, that could potentially occur if we went looking at more sites. So. That's the spiel. Any questions for me? Nick, you said that the uh, 7.5 to 9 acre portion that's being considered is 1.5% of the open space in that area? Yeah, it's about a 1.5%. And so is that um, open space area that's owned by the city or the park? All sort of? That's the public land. Uh, oh, right? so, so it's that public land. Okay. That would not include Esmeralda Golf Course. That would not include Minnehaha Park. That would be... Beacon Hill as owned by the city of Spokane and Spokane County, and then a small wedge that Avista owns where their power lines are, and we have easement to be operating through that space. What is that space being used for? 
that space is primarily being used for outdoor recreational. Okay. So you have a lot of mountain biking that happens over at Camp Sakani. You have a lot of hiking and wildflower viewing and sort of natural land happening uh, throughout that space. And I'd say it's a wildlife corridor as well, right? So we, we do provide um, a, a refresh sort of set of nature for the folks that are dealing with uh, increased development everywhere you go around right. the city. So our intention with that space is really to preserve it as public park land. And there's um, that trail that goes around the up top that they would be keeping, right? Yes. And so during in the other action item, the HBL service contract, that is something that they're going to be working on and taking care of, or is that something? So are you referencing the trail at the top of the screen here? Yeah. So that's largely going to be left as it is today. Okay. Uh, Evergreen Mountain Bike Alliance has a partnership with the city and the county. We have a joint use agreement where they actually manage and maintain the trails oh, okay. at Beacon Hill. So we don't build tra trails or maintain them. It's the mountain bikers. They tend to be younger, pretty active, and super excited, so they do a lot of trail building themselves. Better backs. <laughs> <laughs> they have strong backs, so yeah. And this might not be something you can speak to, um, and that's fair, but have there been safety concerns regarding that trail? Not to my knowledge. I haven't asked that question. Yeah, so okay. So if, if there, there could be, but we don't know. But that, yeah. I mean, I feel like if there was significant safety issues, that might be something that would have been brought forward Yeah, we haven't, we haven't heard anything about the trail specifically. You haven't heard anything about that? Yeah. Okay, thank you. And the dog park will be fenced, and the fence will be inside of the trail, correct? I that is the current proposal, though we haven't put pencil to paper. I think we need to refine some things there. We, we haven't gone to that level yet, but the intention would be that the, the northern boundary of that fence would be south of that trail and that we would concentrate closer to Up River Drive. I don't want to understate, though, that we are looking at that wedge. Um, there is a, pri a private property right here to the left. Okay. Um, I believe that property owner is here. Um, there are two or three property owners that are right adjacent to Upriver Lane and then a couple that access their properties to the north. I think it's in total, is it seven properties there? I think it's seven. Um, I can't be sure, but it's, it's close to that number. So I don't want to understate that this is a significant you know, use of that space, right? So that space right now is undeveloped natural land left in its natural state and, and you know, Anybody can walk through anywhere, so a dog park would certainly take up a big portion of that, and you wouldn't be able to walk in the same location if it was within the dog, within the dog park. So, so it's a trade-off there. So, Nick, if approved, this will be fenced, though, correct? That would have I mean, a we would not put in a off-leash dog park without fencing it. No, so according to the dog park guidelines, you would have to have a six-foot height perimeter fence around the entire dog park area. And you would most likely have a fence within the dog park as well to separate big dogs from small dogs. Thank you. Plus the 100-foot buffer area on the outside of the fence. Correct, okay. at a minimum. And with the parking lot, would the city or the parks board or the, you know, the, the group that's doing the maintaining, they would be responsible for security in that parking lot? The city of Spokane Parks Department would own and operate that lot. Okay. Now, when we talk about security, we would install a gate. Mm -hmm. And our, our staff, and I think I'll let Garrett speak to this a little bit, our staff will actually, you know, open and close that gate seasonally as it's needed. They would empty the garbage. They would maintain that space. But really when we're talking about security, that's going to be the role of the police and our law enforcement agencies. And so I can't really speak to, you know, how they would approach this. Is there going to be a bathroom? There is a proposal for a bathroom of some kind. I don't think it's going to be a permanent structure because sure. we don't have water. Right. So most likely it will be a portable restroom with a shelter or a CXT-type pit toilet like we have at Sakani and, and at uh, Shields. Thank so, you. yeah, we would want to try and provide some restroom facilities there. We just don't have water. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions for Nick from the board before we open it to public comments? No, just thank you, Nick. Yes, thank yeah, you, Nick. Thank you. You've sure. put together quite an overview for us. And, and you've been working uh, on this a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> explained quite a bit. So. We're looking for somewhere. I mean, here's, here's the thing we've learned about dog parks is that everybody wants a dog park and nobody wants it next to them. Mm -hmm. And that's a hard thing to try and strike a balance of how can we protect somebody next to us while also building a, a dog park. So that's really the challenge of what mm -hmm. we're trying to, trying to do. Yeah, well done. Thank you. So now we will open it to public comments specific to the dog park. Please remember the two-minute length for the comments so we can get them all in. 
and restrict your comments to items presented and avoid any critical comments relating to individuals. So if we would start with, and I'll do my very best on names again, Leonard Selvaggio. Uh, thank you, and thank you for the opportunity uh, uh, today. I'm a 31-year resident of 611 East Up River Lane, so I've lived on that property, five and a half acres, for, uh, for that amount of time. Our kids went to Cooper, Shaw, and Rogers because we're in District 81, even though we're, we're in the county. You probably know by now that we were blindsided by this. We didn't know this was happening. We don't follow your press releases. We don't follow what, what happens in the, in the Parks and Rec for the city. Uh, so we found out two, just two weeks ago, I think uh, today, that this happened. So you might have seen, you've seen the letters that we've written? Yeah. Yep. Okay, you have yes. them in your packet. You've seen the, so I'm not trying not to uh, plow, replow that, that you've seen, they've been on TV. There was an article in the paper yesterday uh, as, as well. Uh, you know, we were surprised that we were blindsided because in the June 29th meetings for the park board meeting, it was this, for immediate areas adjacent to potential dog park properties, more outreach may be needed to make sure that there are enough participants able to voice their concerns on a site directly that affects them, and this directly affects uh, all of us that live uh, in, that, uh, in that area. Uh, you know, we understand that you've been down this road before. We know that Garrett and uh, Nate uh, have done They've done, uh, or Nick have done good work and put together comprehensive uh, plans and everything. We don't agree with their uh, end result that they came up with and, and, and uh, was just uh, proposed. Uh, we haven't had much time to think about this. We know that Underhill and Lincoln Park were all voted down at one time and we respectfully request that you reconsider uh, as well. Uh, you saw the parking spots that are going to be expanded right now in those two areas. Really needed. This is an area that's really under pressure today without a dog park. And uh, we've got, it's a riparian area. You're going to uh, pave paradise and put up a parking lot if you want to remember the, remember the song uh, in, this, in, this, uh, in this area. The, we've got four parks. Two city, one county, one state park right in this one little area. Uh, I've got a, uh, we have a number of concerns that are in the letter and other people are going to address. One that uh, I'd like to stress is the wildlife that's, that's there. I've got a f seven month old border collie. That border collie, I took it to the vet. It had a heartworm that can be transmitted to people, okay, that's, tra that's uh, carried by raccoon feces, and raccoons are throughout that area. So if you put a dog park in there, you're, you're going to put people's dogs at risk. The police academy, noise is one issue. The police academy is right across, uh, and the river, and it's loud. I had to call them this year because they put flash bombs. They had to train, they have, we have to train our police. You throw a flash bomb, you don't want the police running for cover. You want them to go running, you know, running to trouble. You know, so we understand that need, but imagine dogs at this park uh, cowering and running, for, and running for cover. You know, and there's rapid fire and um, high capacity um, rifles going off every day. So our ask, you know, to conclude is, please don't, with even all the work that's been done, with the uh, proposal that you have in front of you, do not approve uh, the dog park in upriver. Uh, reconsider a possible relocation, reach out to the neighbors who live in the area. We can provide more input uh, as well. And we may, may we suggest, you know, one, two, three strikes. Maybe try to walk before you run and doing a dog park and do something smaller on the north side so that we get something in District 1, uh, Mr. Bengal, so that, uh, you know, we, we get something for our part of the, part of the city. So thank you for your time. Probably went over time, but uh, yes, appreciate you. your uh, mm -hmm. suffering my talking. The next, Melinda Norman.
My name is Melinda Norman, and I live at 6105 East Upriver Lane. And um, my family and I have lived here for 39 years and counting. We have more knowledge about the wildlife in our area than any study done by the Park Department could possibly ascertain. The displacement of our wildlife would be directly impacted with this dog park being approved, literally. I'm talking about breeding ground for deer and turkeys, nesting grounds for the quail. Newborn fawns use this field year after year for cover while their mothers forage for food. I watch them. White-tailed bucks use this heavy tree cover for sanctuary and refuge after the rut in the fall. We have even seen foxes in the area. These animals and countless others are just not traveling through. They actually live in this area, and they have for many, many years. Based on the park's estimates of 50,000 dogs per park, the impact this will have on wildlife will be devastating. Nowhere in the park's research or plan material did they discuss or determine how to mitigate this. According to the park's research, 79% would prefer dog park sizes to be reduced or located on developed land if it meant protecting natural lands. Many people in the survey were worried that the underdeveloped areas perceived as natural, natural would be disturbed or diminished. It's exactly what will happen. According to the PAC Minute meetings, the South Hill Dog Park sees hundreds of cars a day with as many as 40 cars at one time. This decision will have a huge impact on our area and a negative effect on all of us. No one has more skin in the game than the residents of Upriver Drive. How is the Park Department going to reimburse us for the huge loss in property values we will suffer if this park is approved? Seems like they overlooked that aspect of it. Another aspect they missed is the proximity of our wells and the danger of poisoning our drinking water. No research was done and no consideration was made for this. They flat out do not care. None of us asked for this dog park, nor do we want this dog park near our homes. To add, myself, my family, my neighbors, do not want to go through all what Mr. Cairns was explaining, what he's dealing with up at Palisades, and that is exactly what we're gonna be facing. Our city department, our city police departments are maxed right now. Anytime we have problems, they're like, well, are you city, are you county? And unless we literally threaten to shoot somebody, nobody comes out. And are you guys going to supply us with your phone number so anytime we have problems, you're gonna to come to our rescue? I don't wanna to have to, I live in fear on our streets now as it is. I don't wanna to have to do this in my own home. Sorry. You have noted on here that often general neighbors who care about the well-being of park will step up and become involved in order to keep the dog park running smoothly. I'm not going to sit here and monitor the dog park or put my family in jeopardy to deal with somebody that's jumping fences or I know you guys know what happens in Spokane. Why are you making it even worse? And to have this out your backyard, I'm sorry. Could you finish up? We, so far everyone's gone, both people have gone more than double the two minutes and we have others wanting to comment, so I well, appreciate for one, what you've had to say. There was 1,158 participants in your study, 87% was city of Spokane residents. 150 people, not city residents, took that survey. Yet the park department could not reach out because of us, we live in the county. You guys look at these maps, you knew exactly our addresses. You could have given us time to fight this fairly. Thank you, Melinda. This proposal should not be passed today. Thank you. The next speaker, David Moore.
My name is Dave Moore. I live on Upper River Drive, 6311. I promise to keep it short, but to the Thank point. You. I'm approaching this from a law enforcement perspective. I served the city for several years and I'm a retired Spokane officer. Okay? I've lived out there for 19 years. I've seen it. I've seen the traffic continue to get worse. I had a fatality in front of my house here not too long ago. Okay? I see the bikes. I see the cars. I've counted over 150 cars in an hour and a half. I've also done the, the uh, speed rates out there in a 30, 35 mile zone. The average speed is 49 to 50 miles an hour. This is a huge accident waiting to happen, okay? And again, I'm looking at it from a law enforcement perspective. Why you would need seven acres hidden away where even a, a uh, patrol officer would have to get out and go all the way back in there to see what the problem is. And I guarantee you, there's a lot of problems out there, okay? We've had assaults, dead bodies, rapes. It's something to consider, because like I said, it's not like driving by Camp Sakani or Boulder Beach. This thing is pressure. In the summertime and when the spring breaks, you got cars parked all along the road both ways, okay? And I've seen a whole bunch of pedestrians, including these bikers, trying to get across the road in front of my house. You might as well throw a grenade out there because it's gonna happen. Again, I'm against this for those reasons, not for emotional reasons. I've scraped too many people up off the sidewalk. Thanks for hearing. Thank you, Dave. The next speaker, Deb Moore. My name is Deb Moore. Uh, I'm with that guy that just spoke, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, 6311 East Upper River Drive. Um, we were blindsided by this, it's been said, but uh, in a very short amount of time, we've collected 168 uh, names that also object to this on a petition that we circulated. Um, they're, people are especially, they don't live there, but they're especially concerned about the nature and the, the animals the, uh, that are going to be displaced or um, affected. Um, it's a beautiful area. It's a shame to put a fence up there to do anything. Uh, seven acres is a lot of space. Uh, if you put a dog out there, who's going to run to clean up the poop? Uh, who's going to clean up the pee? And what about our wells that are out there? Uh, there's no water to clean up. There's no water to feed the dog or to give a dog that's just run seven acres water. Um, it was proposed, well, bring your own water. Hardly likely that people are going to do that. So anyway, these people um, signing this petition advocate to protect and preserve our upriver park natural environment, its beauty that characterizes Spokane's quality of life, and to stop the overdevelopment of a natural treasure. I strongly suggest the city not build a dog park in this area and choose instead one of the other more suitable areas they have already identified. Our area is overused. We've got like they said, Camp Sakani, um, we've got Boulder Beach, we've got the Centennial Trail, the river. It's a lot to dump on our area to add more people coming into um, there. I've been almost um, creamed myself turning into my driveway, which is close by, uh, because people go too fast, they're distracted, and uh, just adding more people is just not going to help. Um, it's a uh, RCW requires all governmental agencies to consider environmental impact on a proposal before making decisions. And from what I understand, um, if a proposal has probable significant adverse effects on the quality of the environment, and what I understand is none was done. Um, the property is also um, this. The property is also located within an airport overlay zone for Feltz Field, meaning that uh, it's a protected area uh, for um, should they have to crash there. Uh, so uh, it's, um, it seeks to, uh, that area seeks to discourage incompatible development in the area that might be impacted by aviation facilities. The following uses are considered incompatible 
They include residential uses, uses that have potential to congregate a large number of people in a small area, which is what you're asking um, this area to be used, and, um, and uses in which a majority of occupants are children, elderly, or disabled, or people who could not um, flee if, if needed. Hopefully nev nothing like that ever happens, but the noise level there is huge too because of the um, police academy across the way, air, airplanes flying in there, and um, just a lot of other noises that are not, um, I just believe dogs would not be, um, it's not an appropriate place. Thank you, Deb. We do have a call in. Uh, Christine Gunderson wanted to call in via WebEx. Are you available, Christine? Can Christy. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you fine. Thank you. Uh, my name is Christy Gunderson, and my family has lived on Upriver Lane for over 39 years. We are the oldest residents in this neighborhood and know more about this surrounding land than anyone. The Spokane Park Department, or I'm, excuse me, the Spokane Park Board has failed our neighborhood miserably. The Park Board has a fiduciary duty to engage with the community and residents directly impacted by their projects. It is stated many times in the master plan and dog park guidelines that citizens should be involved in all aspects of planning, and yet not once have the six neighbors been contacted. As you heard earlier, they were contacted yesterday. In fact, quoted from your own meeting minutes in July of last year, for, area in immediate, for areas immediately adjacent to potential dog park properties, more outreach may be needed to make sure that there are enough participants to, join their, to voice their concerns on a site that directly affects them. I understand that five of the six houses are on the county side, but please tell me how you are incapable of finding these houses on a map. All of our houses are shown on every single map of Upriver Park in your documents. Ignorance is, ignorance is not an excuse here. Your public survey included 150 people that are, not even, that are not even city residents, and yet the park department couldn't reach us. At the very least, today's vote on Upriver Park needs to be postponed until you can properly coordinate with immediate community and perform the necessary studies regarding wildlife, traffic, the Spokane Aquifer, and our private wells. You have no clue where our private wells are. You have never asked permission to enter our property to even look. You have not conducted any studies which just show that you don't care about our quality of drinking water. Do you have a plan for us to obtain safe drinking water when your dog park poisons our private wells? I'll leave you with this. You have two glasses of water sitting in front of you. One came from a house on a private well several miles from a dog park. The other came from a house on a private well just feet from a dog park. Which one are you going to drink? Or more importantly, which one are you going to give to your child? Thank you. Thank you, Christy. Next up, we have Linda Valentine. Hello, and thank you again for the opportunity to speak in front of you. I am a representative for the South Hill Dog Park. I'm also on the board and have followed this process through since the beginning. And I can definitely hear the emotion and the concern that everyone has here. And I do sympathize with that. But as Nick had said earlier, everybody wants a dog park, but nobody wants it near them. We have gone through this process of wanting a dog park needing a dog park, and Spokane should have something to be very proud of. This can be a jewel in our crown. And I understand the emotion. I have personally been going to this dog park for years. We fundraise ourselves. We clean up after the dogs. We clean the bowls. We clean the trash cans, we raise money, we are a very responsible group. People who take their dogs to dog parks are responsible dog owners. We police ourselves, and we've been very proud of what we've had in the past. We will continue to do that in the new site. I encourage you 
The master plan says we need this. Going through this process, this is our best option. Safety, I understand, is a concern for everyone. It is for us and our dogs also. Those are things that we can address down the way. Yes, we want a fence. There isn't going to be an irresponsibility to that. The people who go there currently want to continue and participate and be active members in this new park. It's not going to be abandoned. There isn't going to have the opportunity to have people be concerned about their safety. When we have ever been and gone to the dog park, we don't have that problem. We don't have people sleeping in our dog parks. We don't have that, and we won't. Please, please, please let Spokane have this location. We need it. We've gone through all the steps. It's important for us to have that. And everybody, please remember the dogs are important also. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Chad Mitchell. Well, I think basically um, most of the things have been said about the dog park, our dog park, and you've heard it from me m much more eloquently uh, than I can do it. But I, I think it comes down to this. We have between 1,500 and 2,000 people that have been uh, using our dog park, and we've been using it uh, very effectively. Uh, the city and the school district realized the kind of community that we had. We had been turned down, and I understand uh, being turned down by all of the all of the opposition that we've had you know, on the South Hill. I was walking Lincoln Park today, as a matter of fact, and said, "Better that probably we didn't put it in Lincoln Park." Now we have a site that is very suitable for our needs. And I do feel very uh, compassionate about the opposition that has been, been uh, spoken today. But it really does come down to the fact that um, in the master plan, the park department says we need and want to have off-leash dog parks. And they went through all of the, the, uh, the um, uh, effort to come up with three dog parks, hopefully, in the, in the city, off-leash dog parks. We've probably we've lost the one on the South Hill. Uh, the, the school district has been gracious enough to put their money on the one that uh, is on Upriver Drive. I'm hoping that if you agree to site the dog park there, that um, Perhaps the traffic uh, uh, speed limits can be adjusted. I don't know who does that, but if, if uh, they can be adjusted for that period of that space of all of this, uh, I don't know about many of the studies that can be done. But when it comes down to a group of people saying, we don't want it, and another group of people saying, you know, we need a dog park, I think the decision has to be at some point there is a trade-off, and we've given uh, our, our uh, wishes away each time, and I'm hoping that you will at least um, consider the trade-off that I think is going to have to be made sometime at some place, and then this is one of those times. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chad. Thank you to everyone who provided public comments. Um, they were very much appreciated. Um, board members, thoughts? Anybody wanting to give their thoughts before we talk about a vote? Jennifer, you look ready, so. Yep, I'm gonna wait in, here we go. Okay, <laughs> point by point. On the issue of notice, a month ago, I specifically asked Nick Hamid at the park board meeting if the neighbors had been notified. I was told yes, but they hadn't responded yet. I also understand that notices were posted at the site, so that was over a month ago. That's what we were told and we have no reason to believe otherwise. On the issue of polluting water, I recently attended the Hope for Creation Conference at the Cathedral, and Renette Boise from, and I'm probably mispronouncing her last name, from the Spokane-Rathrum Aquifer Joint Board spoke about polluting 
uh, the aquifer and drinking water. She said, by far the greatest polluters are residential septic tanks. It's not going to come from a dog park where poop is occasionally missed or, or dog urine. It's going to be the residential septic tanks in the area. So if we want to keep the aquifer clean, we all have to look in our own backyards first. All right. What we are proposing, we are not proposing that we bring criminals and vandals to your neighborhood. Listen to the few representatives who are here, and unfortunately there's only two of them, but these are good people. The South Hill Dog Park was known for having people who picked up after their dogs, looked after each other, they provided water for their dogs and their humans, they provided picnic tables, they had a rotation and a schedule for taking out the garbage. They brought their own poop bags. There was a member of their group who was in a wheelchair and they looked after her. By nature, people who take their dogs to dog parks are responsible caring individuals because they're caring for their pet. They have good values. So these are people you want in your neighborhood. These are people that are added eyes and ears on the ground. And in fact, Ohio State University did a study that showed that when dog parks go into neighborhoods, they dramatically decrease crime. This study has been done in Vancouver, Washington, Lakeview Park in Oakland, California, Boston, D.C., Gahana, Ohio, and in the U.K. So instead of property values going down, improved safety would raise property values. Most of all, I want you all to think about what you are potentially giving up. The Park Department wants to be in District 1 and make an investment in providing a park amenity to your neighborhood, an amenity that we think would bring added safety, bring something positive. You already have negative activity, I hear. Assaults, rapes, burglaries, okay. You have an influx of good, responsible people bringing positive activity to your neighborhood. That is going to drive out that negative activity. We're trying to do something good here. We're trying to make a good investment in your neighborhood. So think carefully. Do you really want to reject that investment? Isn't there a way that you can partner with the park department in crafting a dog park that is an addition to your neighborhood and provides something positive? I just want you to think about that. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Other comments? Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I represent District 1, you know, the Northeast. And uh, one of the feelings we, we always had as I was growing up was that the Northeast lacked investment, that we didn't have amenities that were destinations that people around the city wanted to go to. We often felt overlooked. We felt as if we weren't as important as, as others. So when this was first proposed to bring this up into the Northeast, I was pumped. I was absolutely ecstatic because it was something that made people want to invest in my area. I believe it's going to uh, be something that attracts uh, good young families to the area as they have children and dogs and they're looking for a place where they can walk to with their families. I'm looking at it when you look at Minnehaha Park being uh, somewhat, uh, uh, somewhat close and looking at the efforts that I've been making with the governor's office on how can we get some significant investment into the Minnehaha Park to make it again a, a, an actual uh, major park in the city of Spokane. Um, all of this seemed to, to line up with what we were doing. Uh, we, we had reached out to several organizations. I personally reached out to the Neighborhood Council as well, uh, to their chair, to see if this is something they wanted. We received that letter of support. I, was, I have been somewhat disappointed, not in, in anybody voicing their opinion, um, but it, that it came in the last couple uh, days, not because uh, you know, it's, it wasn't a priority, but again, sometimes it takes communication a while to, um, to get out there. And so I'm glad that everybody has brought their thoughts and everybody has brought their uh, their concerns uh, with the area. Um, I do look forward to increased engagement, and I do hope that uh, somewhere in the Northeast, and I think this area is a great place for us to have a dog park. I think it is something that, again, will we'll make families, young families, want to come up into our area and invest and build houses. Um, I'm, I'm a fan, but I also would like to see and uh, I'm sure that this is going to come later, but I do have a suggestion for us moving forward on this resolution. Um, and so when that time comes, I'll, I'll make that suggestion. Um, but uh, I love the idea, and I would love to, I actually would love to give you my phone number. And if you have any questions, legitimately give me a call. I will give it to you. I promise you, you will call me. Uh, I'll, I'll defer to the, uh, to the uh, chair on that. Um, but... 
but I do, I do care about this area. I want to make sure it's good, and I, I think this is a, I, I think it's a win for District One. Thank you, Councilman Bingle. Any other board comments, thoughts? How about our? We have three board members virtual. Um, Nick, Barb, Sally. Any, any comments or thoughts? If not, we will turn it back over to Greta for a motion. Hey, Bob, I think that, um, you know, as has kind of been said, not you're never going to make everybody ha anybody ha or everybody happy in this process. A lot of work has been done to try to identify good locations, and I think this is a real positive thing for uh, District 1. I would say, though, in listening to what Jennifer was saying, that um, maybe in the future, you know, Highbridge was identified as a potential dog park candidate, and if, if, you know, bringing dog parks and park things can help uh, increase safety and bring better types of people to certain locations with what's going on in West Hills, maybe it's something we can think about in the future. Thank you, Nick. Well, I would like to just add a small snippet as well, piggybacking what Councilman Bengal has said. We live in the city, but we are in a park area. And uh, we have a lot of uh, extracurricular activities as well. And when we have involved the uh, parks area, uh, when we've uh, enhanced the area with more activities, it has definitely driven down uh, the individuals that we really don't welcome to our area. So uh, I wish I could dedicate that area <laughs> to the parks department right now. Uh, but it, it wouldn't fit. We don't have seven acres, and uh, we don't have a flat surface. But I know, speaking for the majority of the people who live in our five or six block area, um, it would be a deterrent that we would most welcome. So uh, I appreciate what Nick has done. I appreciate all the input. And basic uh, anecdotal remarks you've made, Jennifer. So. Uh, just thank you for that. It does uh, uh, give a whole lot more food for thought. And we did have some uh, very seri serious uh, altercations on our, our roadway and property as well. Thank you. Anyone else? Greta, I believe then it. Uh, this, this oh, Councilman Sally. Bingle, did you? Uh, there's Sally. Oh, Sally. I'm sorry, Sally. I didn't see you. Thank That's you. All right. I, I just a, just a quick comment on this. Uh, I, I've been in support of this location and all the great work that's been done. I I was a little caught off guard today by the comments and surprised by the immediate neighbors and the lack of notification early on. And I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, I hope that if this does go through, that the neighborhood and those that are in the immediate area can be part of the park development and 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 uh, just be an active part of it and make it work for everyone. Mm -hmm. Councilman Bingle. Yeah, just yep. Uh, so one last comment, and then I'll, I'll make a motion to allow um, some people to ask some questions. But uh, for all the adjacent properties. I would like to come out and, and uh, visit your property, uh, hear from you and hear your, hear your concerns on the area. Um, I know that some of you are in the county and I don't represent you, but it's right on the edge of my district and I'd love to hear from you. So um, before you leave, if I could get your uh, contact information and your address, I'd love to come out and, um, and chat with you and, and hear more about it. We can, it's a lot better to see it in person than to see it on a map, you know, see it in a drawing. So I'd like to make that commitment, number one. Uh, but number two, I would like to make a motion for a couple of people who have some questions to be able to ask their question. Okay. Was that the motion? I that, that was my motion, yeah. <laughs> okay. oh, second. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All those in favor of that motion? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, further? Do yeah. we have any further if, questions? If you'd like, yeah, go ahead. I'm so, I'm so sorry, not to interrupt. Would you mind doing it into the microphone? Because yeah, people are watching it. online, sorry. yeah. We, we received no notification. We, we understand from Nick yesterday, we 
Garrett lined up a meeting, a number of us sat down for an hour with him at, at, es at Esme, at Esmeralda Golf Course and had a, had a good conversation. But we, we did, just don't, I don't want you to be misled. We didn't know about this until two weeks ago. Okay. Okay, period. I might be rude, but uh, we have dogs. We have no uh, objection to a dog park. I just, okay, who does want it next to their house? Uh, so I would hope that you understand that. But nobody's talking about the wildlife that are gonna be displaced. What about the deer? What about the rabbits? What about the eagles, the, the ones that use that area? Uh, putting in a parking lot, it's nice. Uh, what if the crime doesn't come, but where do the animals go? You're just not caring about them as much as the dogs. The dogs could be somewhere else. They don't need seven acres either. Um, so please consider that. Thank you. Seven acres is not necessary, but you got a perfect opportunity just down the road. Minnehaha Park. It's flat. It's developed. It's accessible. Give that some thought. Thank you. Anyone else want to have more questions? Or I'm going to reiterate... We were never notified, ever. There was no phone calls, no mail, nothing posted, and whatever he told you is a false and it's lying. Nothing was ever told to any of us. That's why we were so shocked. And you're literally going to destroy this land where, where this place that you could put it somewhere else that would not affect the wildlife. I, I don't get it. Would you want one 100 feet from your house with the noise and the constant people? It's peaceful out there now, outside of the gun range and the airplanes and the traffic. I, I don't get it. We were never notified. I will swear on the Bible that we were not notified. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let's move then to the motion. I, uh, I move that we approve the resolution selecting Up River Park as a location for a new community dog park and accepting ownership of a new neighborhood dog park at 2616 East 63rd Avenue. Uh, this is a no cost resolution and I understand a amendment has been proposed. I, I think the way that we have to do yeah, this to is second we have to second, it first. second the motion okay. and then we can amend it. Yes, and we can so amend I'll amend second the motion. Okay. Please. And I'd like to make a friendly moment that in the first, be it resolved, um, have it finished by saying, so I'll read it in its entirety and then I'll mark out the amendment. So currently it says, be it resolved by the park board to select Up River Park as the location for a new community dog park so long as the property is improved in a manner consistent with the recommendations of the citywide dog park guidelines at no cost to the park board. Here's my friendly amendment. And so long as Parks conducts an additional Minnehaha neighborhood workshop to evaluate potential upriver dog park concepts and generate a preferred design solution with workshop participants, which best mitigates potential impacts on adjacent neighbors. So question, does that allow for looking at Minnehaha Park, that particular resolution, as this park board understands it? I don't believe that's the intention of this right here. It would still be to uh, look at that particular site okay. um, itself. Okay. Is there a second to that, friend? But this is nothing that would interfere with the school district and what we have going. So this would allow us to still move forward. My understanding is that for us to actually get a design concept to be able to right. place that we, we need to adopt this resolution. And so right. not wanting to hinder the process, but also allowing for a better vision to be pitched and more uh, neighborhood more uh, 
in engagement to be done, okay. that's this amendment. This, I assume this would have been part of the process anyway, right? We're just concretizing it in the language, but there would have been neighborhood workshops regardless, right? Yeah, yes. no, we just wanted to make sure that was too. clear. I, I, yeah, I don't have a problem mm -hmm. with yeah. that. So do we do a second <laughs> so on you, that friendly motion? We don't. Is that how? You don't I'll need second, second that. Okay, thank you, <laughs> Hannah. Sorry, I didn't know we're still waiting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the last one. <laughs> Shall I reread the motion or shall we I think vote? we're fine the way it is and including the friendly mm -hmm. amendment mm -hmm. to it. I think we still need to vote on the amendment yes, and then we we'll, do. yeah. Yeah, that's what we're gonna do now, okay. I believe. We do. We're voting on the amendment. Yes. And the then amended we vote motion. on the, and then we'll we vote on the amended motion. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, all in favor of the amended motion. Raise your hand and or say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Uh, thank you, Nick. Opposed, say nay. Appears as though the motion carries unanimously. Okay. And that includes the friendly motion or the additional motion, okay? Mm -hmm. Which I can read yes. if we'd like mm -hmm. to have it be read. Do that again, okay. please. Be it resolved by the park board to select Upriver Park as a location for a new community dog park, so long as the property is improved in a manner consistent with the recommendations of the citywide dog park guidelines and at no cost to the park board, and so long as parks conducts an additional Minnehaha neighborhood workshop to evaluate potential Upriver dog park concepts and generate a preferred design solution with workshop participants, which best mitigates potential impacts on adjacent neighbors. It continues on to say, and be it further resolved that the park board accepts ownership of a future maintenance of the new neighborhood dog park property at 2616 East 63rd Avenue, Spokane, so long as the property is improved in a manner consistent with the recommendations of the citywide dog park guidelines at no cost to the park board and the property is deeded to the city at no cost to parks. I believe that is the whole thing. <laughs> and that has been seconded, so that yeah. will be put to the vote then also. All in favor? Uh, say aye. Raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Say nay. And that motion carries unanimously. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for your comments. Thank you, Thank you for your input. Councilman Bingle? One last comment yes, on please. it, if I could. Um, I, I do want to say that um, when it comes to the city, um, one of the best ways or the, the way that we traditionally are communicating with the neighborhoods is we reach out to the neighborhood councils, we reach out to the, to the groups, um, and there's um, um, a, an inherent understanding of that they are communicating with their neighbors and getting that back to us. And so it's not as if any of us didn't want to reach the neighbors. We went through a lot of channels to try and reach the neighbors. And uh, I'm sorry that we didn't get there, but like I said, I will come uh, to your house. I will meet with you personally. I will sit down, we can chat. Um, do all those kinds of things. Um, and with that being said, I apologize. I do have to run to a neighborhood council meeting. <laughs> so I'm going to be heading out. I apologize, but. Yes. Thank, oh, you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yes, Absolutely. thank you. Any further comments on the land? Uh, we had uh, one other, we had a discussion item. Um, the Lincoln Underhill Natural Land Protection was presented by a local group called Spokane Urban Nature. Their acronym is SUN, SUN. Mm. And that is it for my committee. Our next meeting is 3.30 p.m. on May 31st at the Hive Events Room A, hmm. uh, 2904 East Sprague, and also virtually via WebEx. Thank you, Greta. Sally, any report on Recreation Committee? Yes, <laughs> Recreation Committee had two action items this month. We've already approved the EpiPen emergency administration policy on the consent agenda. So the second action item that we're going to discuss today is the interlocal agreement between Spokane Valley and Spokane Parks and Rec Department to jointly offer certain therapeutic uh, recreation and outdoor recreation programs. And at this point, I'm going to turn this over to um, Jennifer Papich. Hi, everybody. I'll keep this really quick.
as I'm taking forever to find what I'm looking for. Um, She's so good. Sorry about that. I'm not up here very often, so <laughs> you're doing it's like fine. I'm a rookie. <laughs> so really quick, we just wanted to bring this action item to the full board just to highlight the wonderful opportunity for partnership that we're having with Spokane Valley. This is something that we have done in the past with other municipalities. We've done this with Post Falls, with Spokane Valley before, and with the county. So uh, Spokane Valley wishes to enter into a partnership joint use agreement with Spokane Parks and Recreation to advertise, take registration for mutually offered outdoor recreation and therapeutic recreation programs. One of the main reasons for this is Spokane Valley has a smaller recreation department than we do and they don't have the facilities or the staff to offer their own outdoor and therapeutic recreation uh, programs and they want to join with us to do that to provide those opportunities to their citizens. Of course, our citizens already have these opportunities and are more than welcome to register for our programs, but joining into this joint use agreement, they advertise for these programs within their activity guides as well. They have a limited number of spots that they can register their participants for. Some Spokane Valley participants may only go to their activity guide, so it gives that greater exposure. Um, also creates awareness for all of our other programs, expands our outreach to those citizens in the county and Spokane Valley. Some of these programs also that we're providing are new programs or programs that have low attendance, so also an intent is to get these to have fuller registration and more participation. Another benefit of this is Spokane Valley has uh, the Center Place Regional Event Center, and so inter entering into this agreement, we can provide some programs in their facility at no cost use at the facility, so that's another part of the agreement as well, and it's a great prayer transit location, so people that are coming from Spokane to, say, do therapeutic recreation programs have great access to that. It's also on a bus route as well. Um, so with this, when we do the programs, there's agreed upon um, amount of spots that Spokane Valley registers for, and at the end of that class, Spokane Valley will pay the city of Spokane 70% of the revenue for those participants. I basically said everything on slide one without clicking, so I was trying to go really <laughs> fast. But do you guys have any questions that I can answer on this one? Oh, it sounds like a great idea. Yep, yeah, agreed. So yeah, you're just, you know, offering more you know, to a group that really hasn't been able to participate like they could. So I think any time we can do a joint uh, communication or involvement, uh, it's super. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. So I'll go ahead and move that we approve the interlocal agreement between Spokane Valley and Spokane Parks and Rec Department to jointly offer certain therapeutic recreation and outdoor, pro outdoor programs. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay, thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye, please. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion uh, carries unanimously. Thank you, everyone, for that. And I just wanted to touch on a couple other things that might be coming or will be coming your way. Uh, we have some exciting news um, that uh, CISPA, we're working on a CISPA capital grant program that will be providing additional opportunities for our funded centers. This is going to be a one-time investment project that will be offering long-term benefits to uh, centers as they apply for these funds. This money was dedicated um, by Park Board approval in 2022. It's the 1950 account for $50,000. And so this would be a fund that a center would use as a as capital investment and they would um, apply and it's not, um, it's over several years. So we'll be more presented on this in August, so just a heads up that that's coming and that the recreation committee will be reviewing and rating the applications that, and we will share this, the outcomes with you um, this summer. And then also uh, there's, uh, Jennifer mentioned this at our retreat, but the recreation staff is also um, working on the recreation program cost recovery policy. And this has been some amazing work that uh, Jennifer and her team are doing. 
to really um, get a good, better understanding and accountability of how they're pricing their programs, which will help them determine which ones to keep, maybe do more of, or maybe change or, or um, discontinue. And so I'm really uh, kudos to the team for looking at this with a uh, sharpening their pencil and figuring out how to um, make sure they're um, getting the income that's um, needed in order to be successful with these programs. Um, and it seemed like there was something else. Sorry, just a minute. Uh, a recreation program, sir, also, um, a recreation um, program survey is live and uh, gathering data that will help staff programs for the future. So just so you know, there's a QR code link to the survey in our current activity guide and more concentrated outreach efforts. Um, we'll start up this month to get the word out about the survey. And then last is uh, Jennifer Pavich and Jennifer Ogden uh, met with the pro podium staff on April 20th. And just, you know, hats off. Volleyball had a very successful spring season. 300 players per day on average from Monday to Friday. And these players in the past have been scattered amongst various school gymnasiums. And as you all know, when we do something like that, it requires staff in each location, which is extremely expensive. So again, the podium, um, we're really finding good ways to um, activate the podium. And uh, there's also a badminton camp that is scheduled for this summer, which with a few other summer and fall possibilities. Our next um, recreation committee meeting will be May 31st at 5.15. Thank you, Sally. Well done. Jennifer, well done on the proposal. Next, we'll move to the Riverfront Park Committee, and that would be Jerry. All right, we are ready to go. <laughs> we may need to make an amendment that we uh, bump us up a little further. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Riverfront Park, we have Portland, two yeah. items that very easily could have been consent, but we wanted to, I in particular, wanted to make sure you saw the first one, and this has to do with our South Suspension Bridge. And Nick has some excellent photos and things to uh, kind of explain and walk you through. So with that, uh, Mr. Hammond, thank you. You're welcome. Sorry for my tardiness there. Yeah, I've and um, before Nick gets started, I have to run out at 545, but with the eight people here, we'll still have a quorum after I'm gone. So I, th I think that should sure. be acceptable. Thank you, Hannah. Yep, Thanks, thank Hannah. you. Looking for the right one here. We are talking bridge here, right? That is something we, we are. <laughs> okay, so. here we go. I, it helps if you open it. All right, so the Riverfront Park Suspension Bridge, you've seen, there's a little bit of typological or typographic error, excuse me. Um, you've seen this presentation just last month. Um, mm -hmm. The South Suspension Bridge, if you would look today, Garco is actually out there putting their platform, their work platform mm -hmm. underneath that bridge in the wet weather. Well, wow. I'd say dry weather with a ton of spray underneath yeah. them. It's, it's incredible to see. Um, one of the things that we need to do as a part of this project is properly oversee that project, and that is to retain the right structural engineers that know what they're looking at to evaluate that make sure that that bridge decking that we're getting and those bridge components that we're getting meet the requirements of the design. And so that's what this is really about, is a contract with KPFF to add construction administrative services to help support our administration of this project. Because while we can manage projects, we don't really know when it's coming to what to do with the, uh, the structural engineering components. So what are they doing? Their scope includes the review of submittals, materials, and procedures that are submitted by the contractor, RFIs and responses, of course, any questions that the contractor might be asking. Um, while our plans are good, they're never perfect. So the structural engineers need to be involved in that as well. They'll also conduct a, a series of site visits and punch list the work just to you know, ensure the compliance with the, the, the spec specifications and drawings. And they'll, this is the really key piece. They conduct a special structural inspection. As we tear this old bridge apart, as we scrape the rust down to the bare steel, we need to know what parts do we replace and what parts do we not. And they will come out, they have a, a week period of performance where they actually take a, a series of, of measurements to determine which structural components of this bridge go and which stay. 
and that is a critical service for us to have included here. And then when those repairs are all done and the bridge is all brand new, they provide record drawings to show us what we actually got and to have to deliver to our maintenance staff to say this is what you have moving forward. So when we need to do this again, we have the drawing back up for that. So that's what the, uh, the scope is. Their cost is just under $75,000. It's about 3.5% of the overall construction cost, which is actually a very good price for engineering on a bridge. And that's because our, our very own Barry Ellison is doing a lot of the, the project management and day-to-day. And we have a separate contract from this. So the one thing it doesn't include is materials testing. So we will bring a separate contract. Um, it doesn't come before the board. It's under the, the board, Garrett's purchasing authority for the testing of the concrete and the steel components and the welding and whatnot. So that, that's not included here. But overall, uh, about 3.5% for our engineer to come out and do the work they need to do to make sure we build this bridge correctly. And would you add just quickly, to, so I don't misstep, uh, the completion timeline that we're looking at? Well, the bridge itself is scheduled, is required to be completed after 180 working days from when it started, which was last week. Right. Um, GARCO anticipates delivering the bridge substantially, uh, the repairs prior to winter, though it may be you know, sort of odds and, e odds and ends throughout the winter, and we may not open it during the middle of the winter months just because we don't want to put de-icer on brand new concrete, and you know what can happen when we start doing that. So um, we are really looking at substantial completion by winter time to get that work platform off of there before we have ice. And then early spring is when we'll open it, I would expect. Thanks, Nick. Sure. I appreciate it. So with that, I'll put uh, into motion to approve the KPFF Consulting Engineers contract for the Riverfront Park South Suspension Bridge Construction Engineering Support Contract in the amount of $74,626.72 non-taxable service. I'll second. We have a second with uh, Kevin. We'll now put this to the vote. All in favor, raise your hand. They indicate by saying yes. Aye. Yes. Aye. yes. Or aye. <laughs> that works fine. <laughs> uh, do I have any nays? All right. That has passed. Thank you, board, very much. And with that, now we'll move to our last one, which is a very important one. Uh, as all of us as board members know, we had been dealing with Lancer for quite a period of time. And uh, mm -hmm. Amy has been working tirelessly to put this together and is bringing us now how we are going to operate within Riverfront Park and our outlying services uh, with food service and catering. Yeah. Amy? Well, good afternoon, everyone. Today <laughs> I'll be going to provide an overview of our Levy Premium Service Premium Food Service contract. Mm -hmm. uh, they will be providing exclusive catering services park-wide for our brick and mortar facilities, the numeric sky ride, skate ribbon, the Louvre carousel, and the pavilion. And they will be our concessionaire, our exclusive concessionaire for the pavilion. So they'll service our concert series and our events on an event by event basis. So as you know, um, we, and, uh, we uh, have been, we issued a RFP in October of 2022 because um, Lancer did uh, initiate an early termination of their contract. Their last day at Riverfront was February 12th. So we went out to bid. Uh, the RFP committee included members of um, park management, of course, park board, and AEG presents our concert production provider. Uh, the RFP selection committee recommended Levy Premium Food Service for the Spokane Pavilion. Uh, ben & Jerry's was selected separately and uh, they will be operating the Manitou Park Bench mm. Cafe starting here in That's a few a weeks. That's a huge plus. That's great. Yeah, <laughs> we're excited for that. Uh, the contract terms for Levy uh, will be May 23rd, or if approved here, uh, the date of, of the approval, and go for approximately five years. That would be 2027 with a couple of uh, optional extension years, if mutually agreed upon. And Ben & Jerry's would be a five-year agreement as well. Mm. So the structure of the Levy uh, agreement is a little bit different than what we've done in the past. Uh, Lancers was a commission-based only, about 15, between 11 and 15 percent, depending on what the service was, where it was. Um, this will be a management fee, so Levy will be guaranteed a $50,000 management fee per year. This is very typical for 
venues and facilities that uh, operate and do what we do. Mm -hmm. So um, this is gonna be new for us. I think we learned a lot with Levy. We feel comfortable with this. Um, they will also be providing a capital investment of $75,000, which includes some pre-opening expenses, which are outlined in the contract. Um, also licenses, permits, recruit, recruiting, hiring, training employees, and some uh, equipment that they feel that they will need. And there's also an incentive fee, so 2% of the gross receipts if we go over 1.5 mil million per year. So would be a good thing. And the gross receipts will be the gross revenue uh, collected minus taxes, credit card fees, and bad debts. And then our, uh, finally, the, the uh, commission that the city would receive is 100% of the commission. So cost of goods and services will be deducted, of course, and then the city receives the rest. So um, I do have a P&L I'll bring up uh, in a minute, but the net receipts, which is outlined in the contract, includes um, the gross receipts, of course, the cost of, minus the cost to prepare, prepare the food, uh, the goods, labor, training, management. This is a service agreement. They're doing this on our behalf. So uh, we did include the blackout dates, which was very important for parks always is to support our community events. They're 13 that were the same blackout dates that we included in the Lancer agreement. And we've been operating under a letter of intent um, in good faith because our first concert of the season is a couple of weeks from now, May 27th. So um, we also have an option uh, to renegotiate after year two should we need to make some adjustments. And this is a partnership. Um, so we want everyone to be happy and we're, we feel good about this. Uh, I know this is a little small, so I'll just note that um, they did, this was provided in the RFP process. Year one, they did estimate uh, profits to the city at 150,000, which is about three times what we uh, brought in from Lancer Hospitality in the concert season. So um, that covers my overview. Can I answer any questions? Thanks, appreciate it, Amy. Well done, Amy. Yeah. A question, uh, virtual, Sally, anybody else, Nick? All right, with that, I will. No, I don't have any questions. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, with that, I will uh, read the motion to approve. Uh, and move to approve the new uh, agreement with Levy Premium Food Service for the Spokane Pavilion, concession services, and park-wide Catering. Second. We have a second. We now put this to the vote. So all of those in favor, raise aye. your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Amy, it has passed. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you for all your work, Amy. And thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank for, you. Uh, so Keeping it short and quick, but Thanks for really coming on the board. Thank you. See we can't wait to get up to the park bench and into the park. Huh. Yes. Mm -hmm. And with that, John's going to just give us a little quick review of what's cooking at Riverfront Park. So we're going to leave, leave on a high note here. Good afternoon, Park Board. I'm going to make this really quick. Um, so uh, April was a great month for us. It's a shoulder season month, and we had a few events that we just want to talk about. And um, so this first one here on the screen is our uh, carousel story time. And you can see uh, Jill Reeves' torso in the, in the corner there uh, leading a dance uh, and also story time, for, and it's just a great event. Um, really, of course, we celebrated Easter, and I talked all about that last month when I was here because we just were on the... Um, the heels of that event and the spring market. Uh, also in the, so, but I also want to point in just, we redid our concert website. Uh, so our concert website now matches our branding. And so it's a nice cohesive experience all the way through and it matches uh, a good alignment with our partners. So you see that? Uh, one of the events that I'm proud of this last month was our partnership with Blueprints for Learning. And uh, we invited Miss Katie's class out 
uh, and uh, with their kindergartners, and they helped design the artwork uh, for "Do Not Feed the Waterfowl" signs. Uh, they are passionate. They that this is their neighborhood park uh, since they are a downtown school, and uh, they came down and they really wanted to show pictures. And so the graphics you see here are some of the pictures that are represented in honor signs. Of course, we need to have uh, words and ordinances and stuff and signs, but the signs also serve as an educational basis. We want to educate the public why it's not good to feed the animals. Uh, also, volunteer month last month. Um, so, um, parks uh, and recreation executive team, as well as the Riverfront Park team, uh, went and volunteered for Habitat for Humanity. Uh, we went to the East Central location, and we also did um, a Deer Park location. You can see us all in there building fences, uh, putting down flooring, and so forth. It was a good fun. Uh, we also coordinated with Rotary 21, who did their volunteer month. Uh, they came out to the sky ride. They got uh, ferried over to the turnaround station down at the sky ride, and they helped paint that large mural that's been there for a long, long mm -hmm. time. Uh, so you can see uh, the other picture. It's been painted over, and so it looks a lot better. We're actually going to go back and touch it up so it goes all the way to the wall. It looks uh, more polished. But uh, we really appreciate Rotary 21 coming out here and really taking some light that's away from the idea. park. Uh, Case. Uh, Case is a uh, city employee art display. We displayed it in the Pavilion Art Gallery. You can see some of the works there. Very tar talented artists from our own city of Spokane. And then finally, recent news. This happened in the month of May and not April, but I just want to uh, call attention to it that we have completed light blade repair and they, the repair is holding. So all the Generation 1 fixtures have been replaced with Generation 2 fixtures and that is Awesome. So uh, we are now taking light wow. requests again uh, and once again lighting the pavilion up as the beacon it was intended to be. Uh, we celebrated the grand opening of the step well and we also welcome back uh, Riverfront Eats on Tuesdays uh, just last May 2nd. Uh, Bloom's Day, of course, also happened, and this was the first Bloom's Day in the last several years that I can remember mm -hmm. uh, that we actually, Bloom's Day ended then and came back to Spokane Falls Boulevard, and it really activated and transformed the park. It was a great day. Uh, our food trucks did well. Uh, Corporate Cup was held in the Clock Tower Meadow. Really thank our Bloom's Day partners for partnering with us again, and it just made the park experience so great. So th that's what I have to share. Oh, I appreciate it. Thanks, John. Thank you, John. Thank you. So with that, June, on the 5th of June, uh, River Home Park Committee will meet, and we meet at the pavilion. So uh, love to have anybody join us, especially if you want to come in person. So thank you. Thank Thanks, you. John and Amy. I really appreciate your ad. Thank you, Jerry. Next up is the Golf Committee, and Nick, go ahead and take it away. Uh, golf committee. All right. Golf committee did not meet. Uh, we have our next meeting on June 6th at 8 a.m. Uh, get out and play golf. It's beautiful out there. Thanks, Nick. Good endorsement. <laughs> the finance committee met Tuesday, May 9th at 3 p.m. in the Liberty Park Library, and that was also via WebEx. My thanks to park staff for arriving early to troubleshoot anticipated communications, and yes, there were some, and for helping to set up and take down the meeting furniture. Certainly appreciated. Two action items that were not able to meet the land or RFP timeline deadlines were presented at finance. They were both placed on the consent agenda. Rich Lentz presented the April financials, which reflected improved weather impact for golf revenue. Weather does wonders. In summary, Park's monthly financials, they continue to illustrate the reason the Neighborhood Park's Investment Executive Committee was created. We need their work. The next finance meeting will be Tuesday, June 6th at 3 p.m. in the South Hill Library, mm -hmm. virtually via WebEx. I can walk to that meeting. <laughs> DVC, Jennifer. All righty, the Development and Volunteer Committee did meet, and that was on April 19th. And uh, the Friends of Coeur d'Alene Park gave a presentation on their hopes for their enactment of their master plan. They recently made a, an appeal to Senator Billig's office for funding, though that was denied. The whole 
method of putting together a presentation kind of gave them the materials to now create fundraising materials and go out and seek sponsorships and donors. So we talked a lot about how they could use that presentation and those materials to further their fundraising efforts. And then this Citizen Advisory Committee meeting uh, met and uh, Kelly Brown gave the Friends of Manitou recent update and of course the level of professionalism of that uh, with its rebranding, the logos, their plans for the pollinator garden and all of the sponsorships they've gotten have really indicated how a friends group can reach um, for that uh, fundraising bar and really do well. So that stands as a good example for the other friends groups as what to aspire for, um, what to aspire to. All right, so the next development and volunteer committee meeting is May 17th, and it will be in the South Hill Library on Perry Street. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, so we will move down to reports, the president's report. Um, the ribbon cutting of Stepwell did take place Saturday, May 6th at 11. It was well attended, and the rain only threatened. Riverfront Park was a busy place at that time. The initial meeting of the Neighborhood Parks Investment Executive Team will take place on Monday, May 15th, 10 to noon. We have started accepting applications for our board member opening that Christina is vacating. And Barb uh, did provide a narrative for the foundation report. She feels if she tried to give it um, orally today, it might start the echo chamber up again. So. Anyway, was she sent it out in an email to all the board members, um, and I have a copy that I'll give to Sarah here. So anyway, thank you, Barb, for the report, and we will move on to con conservation futures. Nick? Uh, no report for conservation futures. Okay. Who's next in that? And then Barb, as I say, will not be giving it. She did send a written copy out. and. Councilman Bingle has left us, so we'll go with uh, Garrett Jones. All right, I'll take us home. Great meeting today. Um, just a, a couple of highlights, and I just want to thank the board for all the communication, too, and information and on all the um, hard action items that we've had here in the last few months. Um, Jen did a great job, and John did a great job of hitting the majority of these, but June will also see the start of the Wild Horse and Grant Playgrounds with the Susie Stevens Trail. So with those action items, we'll see that construction start in June, which is a great partnership too with those ARPA funds that we received from uh, City Council. And also as a ceremonial partnership ribbon cutting, we'll be uh, forming a date too for the formal ribbon cutting of the Don Cardong Bridge. So look for an invite there. Now that the weather's great, we wanna celebrate what we have going on there. Um, a little bit about urban forestry. Uh, we had a really successful tree planting. Um, initiative over 100 new street trees were planted in the northeast and northwest in the neighborhood with a part of our partnership with the lands council and the spokanopy program and then also we had a great arbor day celebration at finch arboretum and it's probably the first one in my memory that's actually was sunny mm. and nice not that day and, and not raining <laughs> and also too on the admin side uh, the city is hosting a number of different uh, budget town halls uh, just from a, a city-wide uh, perspective so there was one tonight at six, or five to seven, so we missed that one halfway. Uh, but there's also one uh, May 16th virtually as well. Uh, it's really as a, as a city of what the citizens' priorities are for the budget. Also, we're hosting the uh, Washington Recreation Parks Association conference, state conference next week. So they're gonna see a lot of parks and recreation professionals roaming around the city of Spokane. And then also, we're knee deep in budget prep for 2024. Already. So, thank you. So Garrett, the fundraising for Susie's Trail has progressed enough to start, is that correct? For that first phase. Yeah. So first we were phase, able yeah. to find the uh, other uh, dollars within our capital budget. Um, we're just deferring. We had some pathway uh, improvements that we were going to do at Franklin, shifted those into the match for the Susie's Trail to get that complete. It's great to hear. I know it's We've been working on that a long time. It's so yeah. great to see it start. Um, any other comments? Anybody want to have just friendly chatter for a while or can we? <laughs> <laughs> well, then why don't we go ahead and adjourn this at 555. Thank you all for. Great. Hey, yes, thank you all for being here tonight. And thank you for and your, thank your comments. And thank you, staff, for yes. sticking with us. Uh.